So usually this presentation takes a lot longer, and I shrimpied it up because we've only got 20 minutes. Um, but if this intrigues you or interests you at all, I'm more than happy to send you the full thing. So you know, you're welcome to just ask me, and I can just email it to you. And also, when we do this presentation, it's usually in the context of an entire weekend workshop. So WDI USA, which is led by Kara Dansky, um, we've been doing these trainings all around the United States, trying to get uh, feminists on board for nonviolent direct action. So usually we do a whole weekend, and then we actually send them out uh, to meet the civilians, and <laughs> we do an action. And our next one is going to be in New York City at the UN, because we are not pleased. So that <laughs> that's going to be in May on Mother's Day. So uh, that, that'll be the next outing for this presentation. All right, so... This is our Christabel. Uh, we know that relying solely on argument, we wandered for 40 years politically in the wilderness. We know that arguments are not enough and that political force is necessary. Well, how do we do that? How do we apply political force when we have nothing? Nonviolent direct action is an incredibly elegant political technique made for people in exactly our situation. And here's why. The exercise of power depends on the consent of the ruled. By withdrawing that consent, the oppressed can control and even destroy the power of the rulers. Nonviolent action is a technique used to control, combat, and destroy the opponent's power. Nonviolent action has more in common with war than with milder responses to conflicts. It involves the matching of forces and the waging of battles. It requires wise strategy and tactics. It demands of its soldiers courage, discipline, and sacrifice. The understanding that nonviolent action is a form of active combat is diametrically opposed to the popular assumption that nonviolent action relies on rational persuasion or that it's passive submission. Nothing could be further from the truth. So here's some examples. Nonviolent direct action can be used to achieve reforms or specific objectives. And these are the four young men. They were still teenagers. They were 18, 19 years old, who kicked off the lunch counter sit-ins in Greensboro, North Carolina, that spread across the South, the Deep South in the United States. Um, I could talk for an hour about their brilliant use of this technique. Um, they were absolutely brilliant strategists. They'd been trained at a place called the Highlander Folk School, which was the nerve center of the civil rights movement. Uh, all the luminaries of the civil rights movement went through Highlander, so Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, these guys, all the free, freedom riders. These, these, this political training, these kinds of ideas don't just fall out of the sky, so there really was a training center, and I, I feel like I sort of got that um, more generally when I, you know, I came into this in 1980, 1981, 82. I went to Greenham, I went to Seneca. Like, I learned all of this from the women who came before me. And I feel like this is something that we're missing now. We don't have a kind of formalized training to get women kind of up to speed. They're hungry to do things, they don't know how to do it, and they don't have this information. So I feel a great deal of urgency about this. But the point is they had a place where they went for training to do this. They didn't just figure it out, you know, sort of like on their own, like just fell out of the sky like rain. They were trained by people who understood this technique and gave them the framework. And then they took it home and they used it very brilliantly and very bravely. So this is, you know, one example. Um, so NVDA can also be used to destroy whole empires. So this is the Berlin Wall coming down. And I know some of you like me were alive for this. It was an amazing thing to witness. It can be used to bring down dictators. So Marcos was a brutal dictator who ruled the Philippines for 20 years, and this was an incredibly powerful use of nonviolence. When the people withdrew their consent, Marcos was left with nothing, and we watched that live on television over the course of three or four days. So the theory is sound. If you withdraw consent, indeed, you can bring down a dictator. It can be used to defend a legitimate government under attack, this is Prague Spring, 1968. So uh, this is a great example of what's called a civilian-based defense. The Soviets sent in half a million troops. They thought it would take four days. Well, it took eight months because the people stood up and did this instead. Um, eventually, it did fall to the Soviets, but two decades later, 1989, they won their independence back using entirely nonviolent techniques. So in the end, they did win. All right, political violence. 
Um, it's present in any society where status, wealth, decision-making power are concentrated in an elite willing to use violence to maintain their dominance. And we are all feminists, so that elite includes men. When a system that's characterized by structural violence is challenged, the basic nature of the system is clearly revealed. So what you're looking at here is the Children's Crusade. This was Birmingham, Alabama, 1963. The movement, the civil rights movement, had run out of adults who could afford to lose their jobs, lose their houses, potentially lose their lives. We are not the first people who have been through this, okay? If you were a black person in the South and you joined this movement, the bank would call in your mortgage. You had one month to pay off your loan or you would lose your house. They would call in the loan on your car. You would lose your job. So they would lose everything. Um, and at this point in the movement, there were no more adults who could come forward. They couldn't afford it because they were set to lose their livelihoods. And what happened instead was the children came forward. Um, and not just high school students, but junior high school students. Some of these kids were 14 years old. So the stated purpose of their march was to walk downtown to the mayor and talk to him about segregation. The strategic goal, and this is a quote, the goal, get a reaction from the racist officials that would not only spotlight the injustice of the South, but gain national attention and support. The goal was not to get safely from point A to point B. The goal was not to stay safe. The goal was to get a reaction from racist <laughs> officials that would make the violence visible. And they did. Images of children being blasted by fire hoses, clubbed by police, and attacked by dogs appeared on television the world over, and the world was outraged. And not one of those kids lost their nonviolent discipline. Those fire hoses were so powerful, they took the bark off trees. So those photographs were also spread all over. It's very moving to see. So the crusade ended after intervention from the federal government. The, the Justice Department had to come in and stop all of this. Um, the final outcome was the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So in the United States, that's pretty much what we have to get civil rights, is this one piece of legislation. It's stuck on with spit in a prayer, but people have honestly leveraged it into a whole bunch of freedom out of our, our legal system. In a lot of ways, I feel like my entire life was made possible by the Civil Rights Act, um, because women especially have used the Civil Rights Act a lot, but it's kind of the one thing that we have to really make more justice and more freedom. So these kids got it done. Okay, so nonviolent action converts domination to naked force. The violence on which the system depends is revealed in unmistakable terms. The nonviolent challenge has not created the violence, but revealed it. So those kids did not make the violence, they only showed what was there. A perfect example brought to you by the suffrage movement. The violence was there, the women made it visible. A great deal of courage and sacrifice are required to make this technique work. So Jean Sharp calls it political jujitsu. And Jean Sharp's probably the world's foremost theorist on nonviolent direct action. He died a few years ago, but this was his life's work. By forcing the system to react with violence, the actionists alienate the regime from its supporters. They promote greater solidarity and resistance within the subordinate group, arouse the opinion of third parties against the regime, and demonstrate that not even violent repression can compel submission. So women and nonviolent direct action, there's a lot of really solid research out there that's fascinating and also incredibly helpful. Uh, research shows that high levels of women participating in one of these campaigns is basically really good because all of this happens. Women are typically less supportive of violence than men and women's political advocacy often revolves around efforts to reduce violence generally, or more specifically, the peace movement is overwhelmingly women. Animal rights are overwhelmingly women. This is a thing that women tend to do way more than men. And when women participate in a campaign, um, all of this other stuff happens. Women make better movements than men. And this is what's fascinating about it. Everybody knows that women are gonna do a better job. So if there's a lot of women in a campaign, more people will join generally, 
and then because more people join, you have a greater chance of success. So it's this really nice positive feedback loop for once. But this is an edge that we have as women and we should be using it. So movements with more women are more likely to lead to defections among both members and supporters of a bad regime because women bring more legitimacy and sympathy to the resistance movement. And this is exactly what's happened in Iran um, in recent months. They have the most beautiful slogan I think I've ever heard. <laughs> Women, life, liberty, does it get any better? Um, so uh, Masa Amini was arrested for refusing to wear a hijab. She was tortured, <coughs> severely beaten. She died in state custody. And then all of this happens because of her death. Time will tell whether the people, especially the women, can prevail in that country, but all the research about women and nonviolent direct action comes to life in the example of Iran. So the entire thing spreads, and the more success they have, the more people join, and then the more people join, the more they realize they're going to have success, and women are absolutely at the center of all of it. And they did all of this. It spreads to you know, the boycotts, the strikes, all of it. Um, it's just this amazing example, and I... It's been so inspiring to watch what they've, what they've been doing. And here we have our posy. <laughs> We're watching the dynamics of nonviolent direct action work in living color. A five foot nothing mother of four near trampled to death by a screaming mob. Everyone who saw it peaked. There were calls to boycott their wine, their lamb, in fact, the entire country. The tourism board was flooded with angry messages. People canceled their vacations to New Zealand after seeing that video. She showed the world, and she's exactly right. This is what I do, set a trap for authoritarian, quasi-religious cult members to show their hatred and aggression. The stated goal, let women speak. The strategic goal, let these men show the world who they are. Posey did all of these things. And even in America, I had women from all over message me saying, I've been silent, but no more. How do I join? So it's working. <laughs> um, research shows that any level of violence from the protesters, be it property damage or fighting with police, either once or in more frequent occurrences, powerfully decreased perceived movement peacefulness, likelihood of success, and popular support. And this is why it's really important to think about breakdowns in nonviolent discipline and why it's so important not to let that happen. These effects are remarkably huge, dwarfing all others by a factor of 10. And here's a quote, if protests turn violent, the damage may be irreparable. So this uh, photograph is iconic in the United States. Um, this is little Ruby Bridges. She was six years old, and uh, she's single-handedly uh, desegregating the Louisiana public schools. Her parents knew what was likely to befall her. She volunteered to do it. The movement needed somebody to do it. Um, they had to face the system directly and send somebody in there to break the law um, and then to enforce it, to enforce that segregation was now going to be illegal. This is her being led to school every single day for a year by federal marshals. That's how bad the violence, the threats of violence were against her. She faced a screaming mob over and over again. She was six years old. And you should read her autobiography, which is an amazing document. She was not unscathed by this experience, um, but she got it done. So if a six-year-old child can carry herself with this kind of courage, and dignity, day after day, so can we. This technique requires tremendous sacrifice because freedom isn't free. This is war. We have to go in armed, not with physical weapons, we're never gonna win with physical weapons, but with emotional readiness and a strong determination to stay calm, respectful, and courageous no matter what they bring. So here's some myths and some questions that you know, we often get. Um, Nonviolence, nonviolent direct action is passivity. Okay, there's nothing passive about confronting power. Action is in fact in the title. It's action that uses no physical force. Instead, it uses other kinds of force. So don't confuse nonviolent direct action with pacifism. They are not the same thing. What about self-defense? This is a great question. Every living creature has a right to defend itself. And that's precisely what gives 
NVDA its power. The action is specifically lay down that right and purposefully put themselves in danger. That's why it works. That's the exact point of the fulcrum. We are the lever, that's our fulcrum. You don't defend yourself. Instead, you are defending your people as a whole. You let the oppressors show how inhumane and hateful they are in the face of your calm, reasonable demand for basic human rights. You show that you are brave and they are a mob of bullies. And no matter what they do, you don't break. This picture, this is male violence against women organized through the state. The suffragists made it starkly visible and they won. Are you telling me not to be angry? No. Nonviolent direct action is not an emotion. What you feel is immaterial to the success of the technique. What the technique does require is emotional discipline. Actionists have to commit to remaining calm in the face of tremendous threat and potential danger. Not everyone can do it, not everybody wants to do it, and that's perfectly fine. Do the thing that you think will be effective. I think after all my years as a radical feminist and all the study I've done other movements, this is the best thing we've got. But if you don't think it's effective, I, it's fine. Like, honestly, do the thing that you want to do. But lay your theory of action on the table and let's discuss it, because I want to know what you think we should be doing. Um, we don't have a lot, and in the United States, we've got a lot less. We have no mainstream media coverage at this point. We still have not broken through that wall. We get right-wing coverage. We don't get mainstream coverage. Um, you know, we just haven't broken the sound barrier yet. We have to keep going with this. We've had some very serious injuries at our protests, and it hasn't done it yet. We're going to have to just keep going. Um, but I really, um, this is something that I really would like us all to talk about because I have a lot of hope for this technique. It has worked for other people in our situation. Um, so I want to hear your theory of action. Um, Nonviolence doesn't always work. Yes, you're absolutely correct. It does not. There's no guarantee. Tiananmen Square was heartbreaking. So just like a military campaign, nonviolent direct action requires capacity building, trained committed soldiers, long range strategy, short range campaigns, an excellent target selection. All of this you can learn, okay? You don't have to make it up from scratch. Lots of people have been down this path before us. You can learn to do all of these things, but there's still no guarantee. So, as always, we will end with Andrea. Feminism requires precisely what patriarchy destroys in women, unimpeachable bravery in confronting male power. So, thank you.